underline the ways in which uh, permanent war against the uh, enemy, actual or potential enemies of the capitalist state or capitalist class is inherent in uh, modern capitalist state formations. So my question is uh, this, if we are to add a more comparative perspective to your analysis, uh, I'm wondering what would you like to say about non-capitalist or anti-capitalist state form modern state formations, however you may, would like, you may want to um, name these states, and how do these states uh, fit into your theory on the links between war, policing, and uh, state for modern state formation. Thank you. I'm not entirely sure that I know what's going on when you're asking about uh, anti-capitalist state formations. One sec. One moment. One moment. I'm not sure that I understand. Um, Precisely what you mean when you're talking about anti capitalist state formations. Okay. I don't understand I don't to be honest understand those as anti capitalist state formations. I, I said I don't know that I precisely understand what you mean by anti capitalist state formations, yeah? And you're saying that you mean, for example, the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc. Okay, we got that far. Okay. I'm not entirely sure it helps to read the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc as an anti-capitalist state formation. Um, you know, I understand how one might need to read that particular development geopolitically in terms of the Cold War, how it was originally established and so forth. And that's what gives it a certain kind of anti-capitalist status in the history of the 20th century. Um, but, you know, one might equally say, look, there's a reading of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, the Eastern European bloc, which could read it, which could treat it as an anti-communist movement. In other words, what the Soviet bloc was was precisely a blockage on a genuinely communist political development. Because what the Soviet Union did was in some ways it blocked an autonomous working class movement that might have become communist. Um, and I think there's a kind of potential there which has never really been fully explored. Um, but I certainly don't read it as kind of inherently anti-capitalist, um, despite its origins and despite its, its status in the 20th century in terms of the 20th century Cold War and so forth. Um, and in terms of... Um, you were, you're, so you're, you also talked about non-capitalist or anti-capitalist state formations, yeah? Uh, the, the trouble is it's very hard to... The trouble is it's very hard to really find um, non-capitalist state formations in the contemporary world. And I guess what I'm trying to do when I'm talking about war in the way that I'm talking about war is give a little flesh, I think. Well, no, it's not... Flesh is the wrong word. I'm trying to work out what I think Marx was trying to work out with the category of primitive accumulation. Um, in other words, what I think Marx was trying to do with the category of pr primitive accumulation was to really focus in on the forms of violence through which proletarianization occurs and through which capital is, is constituted. Uh, and those forms of violence are, 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 are global. They're international, they're also national. They're foreign, they're domestic. And this is why I'm trying to think about war power in terms of, in terms of you know, its exercise in what political scientists or historians would call you know, kind of domestically, or IR theorists would call the domestic. You know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that actually what Marx was getting at there was, was war. It right? was war waged by capital through the state. And the point is, in terms of your question, is that that war gradually eradicates all non-capitalist forms. Yeah? So I don't have a kind of straight answer to the question of your, your, your desire for a kind of comparative work on non-capitalist or anti-capitalist state formations, because in a sense what I'm focusing on is precisely the kind of violence through which capital is constituted. 
and that violence, unfortunately, is now is is really you know has really eradicated any other form. I told you you shouldn't wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Adam would like to add a couple of more points on to this. I was question, and this is, um, in fact, it's a great opportunity, I'm hoping this is a, an oblique answer, perhaps, but it, a Turkish colleague of mine at, at work at Birkbeck took part or was there in Taksim Square in recent times, and we were talking about this similar, perhaps not, you know, can you point to an authentic anti-capitalist state formation, but it was, she was describing her experiences of being in Taksim Square, and one of the things that she stressed was that there were all, she was kind of a part of a feminist block, and that there were a load of football fans there as well, Galatasaray, I can't remember exactly who, but she said what happened when uh, the police moved in or what have you, was that all the football fans, who she previously and all the kind of women she was with, had, you know, loathed as macho and whatever, showed them how to basically deal with a police charge and help them. Um, and that, to me, you know, it's that question in a sense of, practically what happens in a situation where things that were, or blocks or, you know, positions that were traditionally opposed suddenly come together, and they're brought together for complicated reasons. It's, it's not a state formation, there's no stretch of the imagination that it is, and it's not law, but it's something happening. And it's almost as if, to pick up on one of Marx, uh, <laughs> Marx's points, not Marx's points, Mark here, um, and Deleuze, Deleuze saying that we need to read Marx again as a, as a philosopher. After what happened to the Soviet Revolution, to the Bolshevik Revolution, um, it's as if now we need to reclaim Marx as a philosopher. And it's almost, if I put together, for me, in some ways, it's t too easy an answer, I think. Your question is a phenomenally good question because it's very difficult to answer. But the point seems to me to almost to move away from the abstractions of the, the state and law, and I'm aware that what you will say is one moves away with, from those abstractions at one's own risk. In the end, it's a truncheon coming down on your head. That's the state and that's law. You can't ignore it. But the moments of hope or of change or what have you seem to just be these instances that come out of the unforeseen. So my colleague in Taksim Square and the way it kind of, I mean, I've no idea if that has any longevity, if that, if what happened there produced anything. But that you know, it, the, the, dif the difficulty often, I think, for everybody is to find those moments or those points of hope or of something happening. And I think what I found in Deleuze's provo provocation is perhaps the risk of abstraction is a, then becomes a hopelessness. I can't point to a communist state, what have you, an anti-capitalist state. But that's not to suggest that there aren't states, plural, states in the sense of people coming together, where something is happening. And so it's the, possibly the worst answer to your question, but it's, I don't know, it's that need to then reuse, rethink Marx, act differently, what, all that stuff seems to me to come together in a complicated way. I'm, I'm not sure what, you know, what that means, but it seems a moment, it seems a moment of the now that these things become possible, possibly. Ee, şöyle ki, aslında eleştirisi bütün klasik uluslararası hukuka e, yöneltilmiş, uluslararası hukuk disiplinine yöneltilmiş de bir eleştiri. Ve bu klasik uluslararası hukuk disiplinine, yani aslında Gittorya'ya karşısına alan, haklı savaşı karşısına alan, dolayısıyla hukuki savaş, sınırlandırılma savaşın Avrupa'da hukuku, hukuk devlete savaş disiplin etkili ve sınırlandırılığına yönelik e, bir uluslararası hukuk anlayışında ciddi bir eleştiri sunuyor. Fakat bu anlayışta yola çıkan e, kimi çağdaş ve radikal düşünürler var. Onlar da temelde aslında olağanüstü <gülüyor> kavramını e, bu klasik uluslararası hukuka göre izlenme diyorlar. Nebulos'un anladığım kadar olağanüstü e, kavramını tabi oraya kadar götürdün ya da bunu bertaraf ettin. Örneğin polis ya da asker özdeşliği, iç savaş <gülüyor> ve devletler savaş Arasındaki farkın barışılaştırma yoluyla, yani pasifizasyon yoluyla bir şekilde e, uyuşturduğu gibi bir fikre vardı. E, bu konuya düşünüyoruz biliriz. I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Is it a question about 
international law, or is it a question about the state of emergency? I lost the, I lost the translation for just a moment. Um, can you just? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, so the the advice was to focus on this question of emergency, state of emergency, um, because I think there's a confusion about Vittoria and Victoria. I was talking about Vittoria, the the Spanish theologian from the 16th century, who essentially was the first um, person to articulate a plan in, uh, the idea of a, a liberal uh, set of laws for war. Okay. So uh, I'll skip that. Um, I, th the honest truth is, I think there's actually, um, I think there's too, there's too much talk about about the idea of a state of emergency um, or a state of exception. Um, and I think a lot of it is actually quite problematic. Um, and my argument about it is that actually, although the language of the state of emergency and the state of exception is is widely used by the by the uh, by the ruling class and by the ruling elites it's problematic in the way that it has been uh, taken on board and simply reapplied um, by by people on the left by, by critical theorists and, and Marxists um, because I think essentially what we need to keep saying is that actually this is not a state of exception it's not okay the violence that that we encounter, um, and whether the we here is is what has taken place in Turkey recently, or um, what has taken place in, in in Britain far more historically, this violence is is not exceptional. That's the point we need to hold on to. Right? It might feel exceptional. It often feels exceptional. I understand that, but it's not exceptional. It has an incredibly long history. And what's may, even more important to recognise is that the viol that that violence gets written into 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 law so so what always happens is that what are called emergency powers become normalized yeah so the the the, the long tradition in the uk i'm sorry i don't know enough about specific turkish laws but the long tradition in the united kingdom is for the ruling class to say this is a state of exception right to introduce certain laws to deal with that exception and for those laws to then become normal law, okay? And that's what helps precisely, it helps us understand that what is taking place isn't exceptional, right? That's what we need to register, yeah? And if you wanted to take the point back to Victoria, the pro pro point is precisely, it is so unexceptional, this violence that we encounter, that it can be traced back to, you know, 500 years of, of capitalism. That's what we're fighting. That's what we're facing. So rather than talk about the state of emergency or the state of exception, my argument is that actually what we need to talk, what we need to re understand is emerge is the, is the whole logic and language of emergency, and how that logic and language gets bound up in normal law. Yeah. Uh, yeah, could I just pick up on um, one of the points Mark made in response to the question? Because I think it's, it really is a question that puts its, its finger on a lot of uh, interesting recent work in the area of Marxist international law. Uh, I'm not sure if China Mielville's book has been translated into Turkish yet, but the um, situation, again, to just pick up on something Mark saying uh, in terms of what seems to me to be happening in the, let's call it the radical or critical, or perhaps even specifically Marxist attempt to talk about international law, is that an element of international law, or indeed legal theory more generally, around the state of exception, state of emergency, what have you, um, which I think the popularity of this, my Australian friends are obsessed with Giorgio Gambon and this language of sovereignty and what have you. I mean, speaking as a lawyer, um, 
the, you know, sovereignty is a legal concept. I know I'm blurring now kind of between international law and how you account for national law, but it's as if the theorization or the, uh, the interest in the state of exception, in sovereignty and what have you, takes a concept, which is of course important, I'm not trying to say it's not important, but it tends to skew other ways of thinking, which I think Mark is engaged in, uh, Chan and Mielville is engaged in. I was really interested to see that um, in Tanner's book, there's a translation into Turkish of the work of uh, Ronnie Warrington, who was another uh, a person taken from us tragically young, who was obviously writing about Pashakarnis, the commodity theory of law. Uh, and the, the, the difficulty for me, I think it's there in Mielville and it's there in Pashakarnis and in other scholars, is the perennial problem for a Marxist theorist of anything. How do you theorize law uh, following Marx's lead, where obviously one is concerned with, I'm going to use the language, but I think the language is redundant, but it's a shorthand, the base, base and superstructure. Um, how do you theorize law without simply reducing it to the base? Obviously, Althusser would be important within uh, that conjunction. Um, the commodity theory of law, which often is used in a sense as the best possible beginning to grasp the generality of the situation, yes, not just the state of emergency in a sense, but to try and get at the systemic organization of, of capital. The commodity theory of law seems to be, for some people, most people possibly, the most important starting point. And th this is a you know, kind of comment without an easy conclusion. I'm just not sure that it is. It seems to me it risks reductivism. It risks grasping, in a sense, that reality that Mark is talking about, which is complex and systemic. In other words, the commodity is, is there. The commodity, the commodity is clearly important, but you can't think about the commodity without thinking about money, without et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The international division of labor, which and I think, to me, take, would take me back to Marx's concern, Marx's concern with police and accumulation relates to an international division of labor. Um, the bewildering complexities then of trying to talk about the, the bourgeois fetish of international law in a convincing way through Marxism, it still, still seems to me to be an absolutely open field. There have been important advances, but the, uh, <laughs> the international work in a sense that would allow different people in different places to perceive these problems with the complexity and the systemic complexity of them. That to me is still work that has not yet been done. It's as if, you know, the, the renaissance of Marxist legal theory, that this might be over-egging the pudding, to use an English expression, uh, you know, saying too much, may still be to come in that sense. We have beginnings, I think, but as yet no, to my mind, convincing, or ultimately convincing way of putting together the, the pieces. I suppose is more of a general comment, which is that actually it, it's never a, a bad starting point from a Marxist perspective to, to, to actually challenge or reject the, 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 the dichotomies, the twins that we are encouraged to think about when we are, when we are taught about politics in modern universities. Um, and these dichot and I, the reason we need to perhaps start by just actually saying, no, let's not let's not accept these dichotomies, is because they're always problematic. And liberalism likes to insist that these are the ways in which we should think about politics. So, courts versus tribunals, law versus administration, the executive versus the legislative, war versus peace, and the exceptional versus the normal. Okay, and what, what we're being encouraged to do is to absorb these and repeat them and think our, pol our politics through those dichotomies. Maybe what we should do is just say, no, that's not where we're starting. We're starting somewhere else. And that's what I'm trying to do with you know, exceptional and normal. Say, so actually, that's not the dichotomy we should start with. Yeah? Let's start somewhere else. Let's register the violence of capital, let's say. Considering the recent police brutality and some of the recent events, these are extremely relevant discussions that we are making here.
student actually with the chief of the police and some of us. Uh, it was it remind, it was reminding it's a kind of as I could tell me that just be more reminding, you know, just when we, our statement or our position was uh, responded by these dichotomies, which is, you know, different layers of, you know, the discourse, and, uh, and apparently it's a different way of uh, approaching the issue. Soru var mı arkadaşlar? Son bir soru, daha soramayan diğer arkadaşlardan özür dilerim. This is the last question. Ki pozitif yaklaşımdan bahsetti ve e, onların aslında değeri dışarıda bırakan tutumlarından bahsetti. <gülüyor> Marksist yaklaşım içerisinde, Marksist hukuk yaklaşım içerisinde ve devamında eleştirel yaklaşım içerisinde genelde e, hukuki pozitivizm politikayı dışarıda bırakan e, yaklaşımından bahsederek bir eleştiri konusu hale getiriyor ama değerle ilgili, etikle ilgili tartışmalar biraz dışarıda bırakılıyor. Bu belki Marx'ın e, işte humanist bir algılanma şekli e, olduğu ele, eleştirisi çerçevesinde yapılıyor bilmiyorum ama e, Edim'in söyledikleri bana çok anlamlı geldi bunun üzerinden çünkü sadece eleştirmek şimdiye kadar yaptığımız şey. Oysa ki hukukun kendisi normatif bir yapı ve zorunlu olarak değeri içeriyor. Dolayısıyla Marksist bir yaklaşım üzerinden, dolayısıyla e, politik bir tutumla elbette ki Ee, yeni bir değer, toplumsal değer e, hukukla inşa edilebilecek, önermek mümkün olur mu? Bu kardeşlik, dayanışma vesaire gibi evrensel kavramlar üzerinden mi yoksa kültürel bir takım, hatta tarihsel bir takım değerler üzerinden mi şekillenir? That's, um, that's a really, really good question. Um, there's so much in it. Um, it's difficult quite to know where to begin. But I think what you have said incredibly, you know, great deal of uh, insight is that this, of course, goes to that question of value um, and the value of value. And to do this properly, I think, you're absolutely right, that would have to be the, uh, the term that, I think, drives the whole thing. Um, the, you're right as well, I think, to say, well, this reopens that question of humanism, um, which, given that Althusser is a point of reference here, uh, becomes such a an important theme within certainly you know contemporary marxism and I, i sense i might agree with you to be to if i understood correctly what you were saying is that we can't just shut down the question of value or the indeed the question of the human being um which i, I again i would agree with you that that question of the human being clearly takes us to embodied human beings to questions of gender to how we use the term humanity and human beings and and, and that uh, kind of language that again has been largely seized by a liberal project. So all the great terms in political freedom, you know, etc., rights, have been appropriated and again, the sense that Mark was saying, given meanings that we have to start with. So the difficulty, as you're suggesting, is how we disturb those meanings. I'm not sure I want to, you know, follow Althusser and abandon the question of either Hegel or the human being. That seems to me to be a potential site for the precisely the task that you're talking about, which is so multifaceted. You know, I, I think that the uh, unless you see that as such, to begin even trying to answer that question, to act on that question in the present circumstances is remarkably difficult. And it's very, very easy to lose your bearings and simply to give way to, uh, to despair. But the peculiar thing, and again, I think this is where your question started, was the way in which a particular mode of positivist liberal jurisprudence has reintroduced this Aristotelian question of what it means to live well. Now, that question is, of course, you know, I'm not going to try and answer it, but it, as a way of setting up a field, the way of constituting a way of thinking or talking about law. And the, the funny thing is, if you read Ras, he talks about alienation. You know, the, the themes of alienation now being talked about in jurisprudence are being talked about actually by the liberal positivists. Yes, the, at least in terms of, again, it's, it's different everywhere, but, you know, uh, the, the way that Marx, the way in which a law student would read Marx is through jurisprudence. And the kind of Marx that they get is a straw man Marx which starts with the starting point, 
look what happened to the Soviet Union, therefore Marx was wrong. That's unfortunately the way in which Marx as a philosopher is reduced. So that question of value, that question of right, that question of humanity that you can get at, I think, through Marx and Hegel, as a mode of analysis, as a way of thinking about politics, as a way of thinking about how economies should be organised, simply slides out of uh, the university, the focus of the university. How to reclaim it strikes me in a sense to work on the territory of the enemy. They started to talk about value, but well, we can take them on, because ultimately their account of value is not as good as Marx's, because it forces us to think about economic structures, social structures, the systemic inequalities at national and, and a global level that result from a particular organisation of economy which is now increasingly passing for the only way in which an economy can be, can be organised. So I completely and utterly agree with you. I think you're absolutely correct about the way you set up that question. Um, I'd love to talk to you further, um, but I just think you're, that's exactly the, the situation to me as well. Thank you for your question. Özellikle dördüncü kitabında, yani güvenliğin eleştirisinin dördüncü kitabında, dördüncü kitabında e, güvenliğin aynı zamanda devlet aygıtı olarak zorun, güvenlik aracılığıyla da bir metalaştırılmasından bahsediyorsunuz. Güvenlik aygıtlarının ve zor aygıtlarının. E, fakat bu güvenliğin ve zor aygıtlarının metalaştırılması, diğer her şeyin metalaştırılmasından devlet açısından farklı bir konu arz ediyor. Bir yandan da devletin bu zamana kadar tek elinde bulunan zoru kullanma e, potansiyeli ve ayrıcalığı devletin dışında bu zorun kullanılabileceği birimler yaratıyor. Olası bir e, işçi sınıf hareketinde, bir sınıf hareketinde zorun devletin kendisinden bu şekildeki bağımsızlaşmış biçimleri ileride karşımıza ne tür şeyler çıkartır? Yeah, okay, um, thank you. Um, I don't, I, the, the point in the book is not, is precisely the, is to say that precisely we should not be talking about some kind of problem of the privatization of violence. That's, that, it goes back to my, my answer to the previous question about rejecting some of the language through which we are encouraged to think politics. And, and now, some people, you know, on, on the left, um, lots of liberals, lots of academics talk about the problem of the privatization of violence. Um, and my argument in the book is that actually that's not the problem. Um, that's not the language we should be using. My point in the book is that the language we should be using is the language of commodification. And if we think about security as a commodity um, and read security through Marx's arguments about the nature of the commodity and commodification and commodity fetishism, then we enter a different argument. It's not an argument about privatization, it's an argument about how we treat security in the context of capital in general. Yeah? So I needed to clarify that because in a sense the point of that chapter in that book is to say no, let's not use the language of privatization. The other thing of course is there's a very obvious historical point to make which is that actually historically um, vi the, the, the use of violence has been incredibly privatized <laughs> yeah, in terms of the history of human of humankind and certainly modernity. Um, so there's this kind of strange kind of historical myth set up that somehow the state has always had a monopoly over, viol over security and violence and that somehow something is being transformed now. And I, again, I just think that's a misreading of history that's pl planted in front of us, um, that's put in front of us in order to encourage us to think about security and violence in a way that actually we shouldn't be. We should be doing something different when we're thinking about it as Marxists, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, I mean, in terms of the, 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 um, the, the, what possibilities of violence this creates, I think the point, the point <laughs> part of the logic of saying, let's not start with the problem of privatization, let's start with the, the, the fact that violence is carried out against workers and in the name of capital and by the state and in the name of things like peace and security and law. 
What that partly is politically designed to do is to say, and that's important for us to remember, right? Because actually at some point, those acts of violence have to be turned around. We actually have to in, uh, accept that counter violence is, is necessary and important. You know, pacifism is a political dead end. 